welcome to lecture 14 for multivariable calculus. We're in our new environment. I'm here in the basement of Engineering Terrace. Let's get some important things out of the way. That is my kindergarten diploma behind me, in case you worried I wasn't credentialed. Students gave me the War Games poster, and if you want to really want to hear that story, you can uh, talk to me after class at some point. So we'll be here for a little while. I'm hoping we're back in our live classrooms in short order. In the meantime, uh, I have nothing smart to say about COVID-19 or epidemiology or healthcare policy, um, but I hope you're well. I hope you take care of the vulnerable people, people um, around you and that you're doing all right. In the meantime, let's do some math. That's all we can uh, really do here. A bit on the, a bit of note on the uh, format here, my intention is to record these lectures uh, ahead of time for each class meeting. I'll put the theory and definitions and things that that are somewhat passive uh, here with the idea that you'll watch them ahead of time. And then we can use our interactive sessions um, to, to interact. We'll have practice problems and examples and lots and hopefully lots of question and answer um, there. After things about this format that we want to utilize in the future, uh, please do send me feedback. Right? Tell me what's uh, what's working. Be like, hey, can we do this even when we're not um, doing social distancing or, or trying to fight a the spread of a, uh, of a virus? Um, really. All right, let's dive in and uh, do some work. Uh, by the way, you can also um, give me some feedback as to whether it's a good idea to have my face here in the corner versus just recording the screen uh, there. I encourage you to get the notebooks in the usual, uh, usual location from Canvas and, and follow along as we, as we do this bit and pause as, uh, as necessary. So quickly, first announcements as usual. Of course, there's no quiz uh, this week. I wasn't going to do it anyway with spring break um, coming up. I will post a second lab. It will be optional, but can replace a quiz grade, and so I, I'll recommend it. Uh, I think I'll do it on integration stuff, which we're going to start. Um, uh, today, although I was going back and forth on that. Stay tuned to announcements for, uh, for notes. Homework 8 will continue as usual. It'll just be this one lecture worth of material on integration, um, but it's already posted. Uh, it is due after we get back, but luckily we have the infrastructure for, for, doing, um, for doing stuff. Quick review, because we usually do it. Uh, this is Lagrange multipliers is a topic we should know and be be ready to do, even if there's no quiz. And so what is it for? Right. Finding local maxes and mins of a function f, given a, con a constraint, right? namely that your variables have to stay on the level set of some other function g. Uh, and in that setup, it's nice. We look for our extreme points where this equation is satisfied. So you take your two gradients, right? the two gradients point in the same, uh, in the same direction. There's another or look. Right? It's one thing we have to be careful on where the gradient g is zero. Notice we can't solve this, but that might also be an extreme point. It's sort of a rare circumstance, but, but you can cook up examples uh, where you find the extreme here and you would miss it if you, if you weren't looking for, for, those, uh, for those things. Uh, now that review is not going to really help us all that much today because we're really doing a dividing line now. We're sort of going to move out of differential calculus, at least for a little while, and into integral calculus in uh, multivariable equations. So we're going to do inter intro to multiple integration uh, today. And there are four objectives I hope to get, uh, to get through. And by the end of this week, you'll, you'll feel comfortable. I mean, the one is, first one, probably most important, defining what we mean by a double uh, integral, uh, and then we're going to compute them using iterated integrals. And those two concepts are really actually different things. There's a definition, and then there's a way to compute them. And uh, they get muddied a bit in, uh, for a lot of students, and I think it's healthy if you can kind of keep them, uh, keep them separate. Um, then we'll do mechanics of changing the order of integration. Uh, it's conceptually not hard, although there's a little geometry involved sometimes, and it's good, it's good practice. So those are good good problems to practice doing. I'll give you an example uh, or two of those. Um, and then by the end, we're going to talk about converting into polar coordinates, and this rich subject of changing coordinates um, in general in mathematics, but particularly in integration. And it, but it, it's also can, can be a bit confusing. So we'll start easy 
right? Starting with coordinate systems we know our usual x, y coordinates for the plane, and then we'll move into our theta coordinates and see how integ integrals are affected that way. It's also a good way of understanding what, a, what an integral is, and there are some cool examples uh, there. Um, so let's go ahead and do it, and a good place to start, of course, uh, after we see the uh, resources, these are posted on Canvas. Click through, do read, right, do read the sections uh, as necessary. Uh, as we should remember what an integral is uh, in the case of one variable, right, which you spent a lot of time uh, studying, but maybe it's been a little while. So let's, let's first let's look at this object here. It's a definite integral of one variable, right? so f is presumably a function of uh, uh, one variable and then a to b are the limits of integration, and we really should think of uh, the whole interval from a to b that we're integrating, right? We're taking out all the values of f between those. And then there's this dx thing, and you, if you're like me, you never get a satisfying answer as to what dx uh, really is, and unfortunately, I'm not really gonna give you one uh, here. I can say things like it's a one form, or it's a measure, or, or fun, uh, fun things like that, but it's just, it's a bit involved to, to really define it rigorously. However, uh, it has a very, very practical function. It tells you the, in, the variable you're integrating with respect to. In one variable, calculus, there's kind of only one uh, choice, and so it, it seems redundant, but certainly in multivariable calculus, where you have lots of variables, it's going to be really useful to keep around, okay, which variable are we integrating where? Um, let's see that. Right. But let's not forget the definition of this. Thing. You probably remember how to compute it using antiderivatives, but that's not the definition. Definition is a limit of sums. The person who taught me uh, calculus last century uh, phrased it in a way I liked. It was that uh, doing calculus is nothing more than translating from Greek to German. Uh, so we see down here the, the discrete finite limit uh, written in with the Greek S, the big sigma here. It means add up a bunch of things. Uh, we see a delta x, and so what are we adding up? We've got the value of our function at sample points. These are individual points along our um, uh, our domain of integration, right? the interval from a to b that we're integrating along. We chop it up into capital N, N pieces. Each one has a certain width, so we measure in the domain the width, and we multiply by the value of the function somewhere. Anyway, we add up all these things, and so when you take the limit, you can say right, the Greek becomes German. This is the German S. That's where the integral symbol comes from, in case you're wondering from Leibniz. Um, here, and of course, the delta becomes a D. Um, but what's important to know is really this thing's a sum, right? It's really a limit of sums. We're adding up all the values of the function relative to some measure in the base. Right? All integrals have that, uh, that kind of um, form. Uh, so here's the picture that goes with that. I hope it's uh, familiar to, to you. So we've got our interval in this case. I'm looking like I'm going from 0 to 2 uh, for this integral. Here's the integrand. It just has a pleasing shape. That's why I, I picked it. And then we decide big N is how many intervals we chop this uh, up to. Actually, let's fix this while we're here because I see an error. The sum should just go from 1 to N. We should have N capital N pieces. Uh, it won't affect the limit, but that's better. Okay, so I'm going to chop this into, right, when n is two pieces, I chop my interval into two pieces, and on each piece I measure its width, I measure the height by some value of the function in that interval, and it's the xi star there is a placeholder to say, oh, okay, pick some point in the ith interval. I can actually change that in this little graphic here, right, s is at 0.5, it's right in the middle, and right? I can move it all the way to the left end point. So notice I'm sampling my function at the left endpoint of each interval, right? Or I can move it in between or all the way to the right. So now I'm sampling my function at the right endpoints um, here. Of course, if we're taking limits, it doesn't matter for continuous functions. They all converge to the right, uh, to the right answer, which is what the interval is. So this, all this business with xi star, right, in most practical terms, doesn't right, doesn't matter. And then we take the limit, so n is going to go off to infinity. The number of boxes goes off to infinity. Right there it goes. Only have to 
22, which is a bit shorter than infinity, but you see that it starts tracing out the shape. And you see that we can interpret this as measuring area in, uh, in some respect. But of course, these functions need not, the values here may need not be positive. You see the negative values of the function here, and so you've got negative area being added. And so an integral is not just area. It really is just a big sum of things, right? values of your function being summed up uh, in some way. Uh, and so it's, it's better to get away from the idea of just that an integral is area because uh, that'll prevent you from doing real, real applications. Okay, hopefully that's all. Uh, review an old, right, old hat. I will point out how do we do uh, simple numeric integration in uh, Jupiter. I won't belabor this point, but it uh, might be useful for, uh, for some of you. If you want to check your numeric answers when you're integrating something, well, this is the, right, the um, Python function that does it. It comes from SciPy. Right, you know, NumPy is the numeric Python, and then SciPy has a whole bunch of uh, scientific libraries and ideas that um, uh, you can import and, and use, and one is an integrate uh, module, and it's got this function quad for quadrature, which is an old-timey uh, term for integration, right? You see the, the quadrangles that, that make up your integral here, and that's why integration is called quadrature in some. Uh, in some circles. So quadrature, quad is the integrator for sci-fi. And so what do you give it? Well, then you give it a function, it's lambda notation, it is a way to say, oh, give me the function that takes x to 1 minus x squared plus x cubed over 4. Right? So that's what this whole line here so just refers to the function that takes x to so some very useful Python notation. So you don't have to name the function, but they're literally called anonymous functions. Um, but you can specify a function by what it does to x, which is what a function is. And then it gives you some limits, right, from 0 to 2. Right there. And what happens? It spits out, well, it looks like it spit out two numbers here. What happened? Well, it spit out a third right here, or very close to a third. And it's rounding errors whenever you do floating point arithmetic uh, in Python. The second term, you may be wondering what this is. This is the estimated error of your uh, term e to the minus 14 here, that's scientific notation, so you get 1 times 10 to the minus 14. That's, that's pretty close to zero for most of our uh, practical purposes. So this is a very accurate, it's a pretty accurate answer. The exact answer any of us could calculate, and indeed it's, it's one third. Um, anyway, I'll just leave this code in the notebooks in case you want to, to practice on some other, on some other functions. Okay. Talk about multiple integrals now, right? We talked about we know how to integrate with respect to one variable. We did count one and two especially. Um, but what are multiple integrals for? And so these are really integrals of functions of several variables. That's the short answer uh, to it. Um, but rather than going to kind of volumes, which is often the way these things are introduced, I like to get away from the, the really geometric picture and instead ask a more simple basic question that you everyone can understand and has an answer. What's the average altitude of Bolivia? Here's the map of Bolivia. You see some contour lines for the various altitude, right? We know that La Paz is, is the capital, so quite a high elevation. Over ten thousand feet I think. Um, uh, here. Anyway, uh, you may not know the answer to this question. Actually I don't either. But you certainly understand that there is an answer to this question. It's, an, it's a question everybody understands, right? The elevation of uh, Bolivia changes from place to place, right? It's sort of changing all over the place, right? All over, uh, literally all over the map. But there's some notion of an average value overall. What's the average value? There's some number that answers that question. It's a single number that answers average value. Well, how would you compute it? The averages we know of as being uh, sum of a list of numbers dividing by how many there are. But there, we have an infinite list of numbers here. Right? What makes this a multiple integral is that the input to those numbers can be specified with two variables. So let's boil it down. To math, right? I want to measure average altitude. So I set up my function f of x, y. So the input is a location, horizontal and vertical position, you know, more or less latitude, longitude um, uh, here. But we model it somehow with with two variables. The output is altitude. Uh, 
here. And then we have some domain that we're integrating over. I'll call it B here. This is important. This is the equivalent of the domain of integration in one variable right, from A to, uh, to B. But now it's a region in the plane. Right, so our, in this case, a region in South America. There. But it's a set of points. Right, it's really the domain of our function right, that specifies different places in, in Bolivia. And so now if I want the average value, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to integrate this function over the set right there. And then what I divide by, instead of the number of values, I divide by the area. So here's the set. Average altitude. We'll call it F average right here to realize an average value. And I'm going to have one over the area. Right, so it's an average. And then this is the, the new creature we're going to study. It's a double integral, hence two integral signs. I put the where I'm integrating down here. Right, it's one set uh, there. I often represent it with this calligraphy font. Um, there. But it's good to name where you're right, where you're integrating. There's the integrand f altitude. That's the thing I'm integrating. And then in place of what was dx, which measured a little piece of the in, of the number line in one variable, dA is going to measure a little piece of the plane. It's, think of a for area. Right. So it's a little piece of area. We get. I like thinking of average value. That's a good first application of a double integral to think, to think about. Right? You have some function that measures something on, with multiple inputs. Temperature in this room I'm in, for example, moving around, there's an average temperature in this room. Right? I'd use a triple integral to calculate that. Right. OK, so now let's do some technical. So here's the definition of the double integral. First thing we're going to consider is rectangle. So this notation, if you're not familiar with it, it's a Cartesian product. It just means x goes between numbers a and b, and y varies between numbers c and d. And that's what this uh, says. So it's like an interval in one dimension wrapped up. So we literally get a rectangle in the plane. So r is a rectangle. We're going to integrate over r. We have our integrand, the thing we're integrating. That's a scalar value function of two variables. And then again, what I call the area form uh, here is dA. It just reminds the reader, oh, we're integrating with respect to area. Uh, so I'm adding up the value of the function times an area over this uh, rectangle r. Um, the definition in, uh, involves, again, a Riemann sum. Now it's a double sum. Right? We're going to integrate in two uh, directions here. But it should look like a regular Riemann sum when you do a double sum right? for each I, you add up n j, so we get m times n terms uh, here. But each term is a value of the function on some little rectangle now inside our domain times the area of that rectangle. Right? So instead of a value on an interval times the length of the interval in one dimension, we've got a value on the rectangle times the area of the rectangle. So when you add these all up, what does it look like? Well, here's the a good example. I've got a function, right, 1 minus x squared plus y cubed over 10. All right, that's this surface you kind of see in here. I'll rotate it uh, a little bit um, uh, for you. And then we chop up the domain into a bunch of sub-rectangles. Right? We number the ones in the x direction with i, typically, and the ones in the y direction with j. And then what do we add up? area of each rectangle times the value of the function we see there. And we can interpret that as volume here. Right? It's the volume of a little rectangular prism with sign, just like in one dimension. If f has negative values, you see we get these negative values here. And then as we add up all these terms and we increase the resolution, increase the number of boxes here, and wrap it up might take a little while to render here. Well, there you, can, you can see it. What do we end up doing is we end up kind of filling in the space between the surface, the graph of the function, and the xy plane. Uh, now, so really the signed volume in this, um, this context. But it'll be more useful just to think of a big, giant sum of values. Uh, so we're going to use intervals for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things. OK, uh, so your quick example, s is a rectangle, 0 to 1 in the x direction, 0 to 2 in the y direction. Estimate this double integral using a 4 by 4 partition. 
and we've got three ways of sampling the points. These are different ways of choosing that point where to evaluate the function in uh, each case. Now, rather rather than step through all the details here, I'm going to show you some code that, uh, that does this, and on your own time, as necessary, you can, you can really unpack it uh, here. But to describe it pretty quickly, first of all, notice here's the integrand, x over y plus 1. Perfectly smooth where we care, right? y is between 0 and 2, so there's no issues with dividing by 0 or anything here. And there's a nice smooth integrand that's going to integrate no problem. So a 4 by 4 partition means chop the x interval up into 4 pieces and the y interval up into 4 pieces. So they're not going to be the same size. Right? x is going to be divided into, uh, into size 1 quarter and um, y will be divided into size 1 half. Right? Two exactly. I'll show you how, we, right, how do we compute all this. So I define my integrand f, right? x right? Uh, divided by y plus 1. I'll define my endpoints, A, B, C, D, to make this look nice. And M and N are 4 and 4. That's how many intervals we want in each uh, direction. Then, like delta X and delta Y in the, um, in the Riemann sum, you see those computations here with the interval divided by M, with the interval divided by N. And then these three sums here are going to be the lower left, the upper left, and the midpoint. That's why I use those terms here. So what do we do? Well, every term has a dx times dy. That's the dA, or the area term. Right? We know in this case it's going to be a, qu uh, a quarter times a half, right? an eighth for each one. Then this is the way we sum a list in uh, Python. We just use the function sum, and then we give it the list. This thing in here is pretty neat. It's called a list comprehension uh, there, and all it, it's basically the code way of saying that big summation uh, symbol. So what are we going to sum up? Right? The function for x in the range from a to b with skipping a step of size dx. So this starts at a, right? actually starts on the left uh, at a, and moves over dx every time. And then we do the same thing in y from c to d right? with steps of size dy uh, there. So all told, I take the value of the function here for x, for y. So this will give me a list of uh, function values, we add them up, we multiply by dx dy, and that gives us our um, our estimate. What changes in the upper left? Not much, just where we evaluate the function. Right? So upper left means that we're going to move up in the y direction, but we leave x alone. And if you look over here, right, what's changed now, the range of values starts at c plus dy. Right? One, one change in y away from c. And then we have to go up to d plus d1 um, uh, there. But that's the only thing that changes uh, right, in this in the sum. And then for the midpoint, right, again, these are sort of the nitty gritty details, but worth noting. Again, we're just same delta a, right? still the same function we're adding up, it's where we evaluate this function changes. I'm going to start at a plus dx over 2. Right? So that's halfway into the first interval right there. And same with y. y starts at c plus dy over 2. And same, right, everything else must stays the same. And then we've got this print statement, which makes things, right, makes things uh, nice here. Uh, and so there are estimates for integral using four intervals. You could do this by hand, of course, with 4 by uh, with 4 by 4. What's nice about the code thing is it's like, well, instead of using four intervals on each, um, on each interval, let's use 14 and see what happens. Well, what happened to those numbers? They got a little closer together. We should expect that, right? As the number of sub rectangles gets higher, right, our estimates kind of converge for the different sample points. And about, uh, about 140 for each. Well, ah, you can see they're getting a good bit closer uh, together now. Right? And that's nice. And of course, we can we can ramp this up. I don't know. So the last one, 555. Subintervals, oh, that takes a little bit of thinking, right? Python. But we, we add them. Um, if you want to know how computers actually compute uh, integrals, I mean, it's like this in that they just do do sums, but there are a lot smarter ways that don't take that long to, to find for, for a numerics class right, another time. 
so how do we, how, well, at least what we should know that the command is. So just like quad integrated one function, double quad DBL uh, quad integrates functions of two variables. And this is a useful thing to keep around when you want to compute something by hand and then check that your answer makes sense. Now it comes with a big asterisk that's uh, a bit annoying. If you look at this code, it almost all makes sense except for right here. Right? Why are the why are the variable names uh, reversed um, there? I'll, I'll get to that in one in one second. Um, but if you remember that, everything else makes sense. Right, so I'm going to throw in a function. All right, x over y plus one. X is going to go from zero to one. Y is going to go from zero to two. And then remember, it's quad spits back the integral and the error. If I just want the first term, I put this little zero in the, right, the first term of what it, of what it spits back. Um, so that's, well, let's see what double quad spits out. Okay, so there's my, my it converts. There's my, my estimate for my total integral. Notice that's at least in line with what we were finding right, as we increased m again. Um, uh, here, here's this quirk about double quad, just if you want to see the help file, I won't belabor this, but it's worth uh, noting, right, so double quad, you give it a function, a to b, g fund to h fund, and see what, why those can be functions uh, in a second. But notice it says return the double definite integral of fun y, x, right, that's just reverse order uh, here, right, so a to b is sort of on the, on the second um, variable. I have asked, this is a holdover from MATLAB, and I've asked anyone I can, What's the reason why you know why it was coded this way backwards? And I haven't gotten a satisfying answer uh, yet. There's probably some reason I don't understand. But anyway, one of those quirks when you translate things into the technical realm that you have to you have to remember. Okay, so properties of the double integral. These are great. They look like one variable integrals, and it's exactly what you'd expect, especially when you're dealing with a limit of sums. So what this says is. If you're integrating the sum of two functions, you can integrate them separately and then add them. Okay. A fancy way of saying that integration is linear. Right. Here, practically speaking, if you have a bunch of terms in your integral, you can deal with them all separately. That's all that, uh, that, that means, but, but good to know. Uh, same with constants. Right? You multiply them by a constant, you can pull it out. Right? All it does is scale um, uh, the whole integral by, right, by the amount. This one's more useful than you might think. If you integrate a constant right, over some region, you just get that constant times the area uh, of the region. And this works in 1D, where we see this when you integrate a constant, you just get the constant times the size of the interval. Right? If you integrate from A to B, the constant C, you just get C times B minus A. Um, there, right? so it's like length in one variable. Well, that's like area in two. but this is useful because sometimes you can have wacky regions that you want to know the area of, and intervals will answer that. Um, will answer that. Okay, so, so far we know what a double integral is, right? we'll do lots more applications uh, next time, but the question is, all right, how do we actually evaluate these? We don't take limits or, you know, code with double quad, usually we can do these by hand. And a preliminary question, to that is what sort of mathematical objects is this thing um, that we're looking at here? And it's almost familiar. It looks like a single variable integral, except I've got a function. I have two variables in here. I'm going to pause and think about it if you like, but I'll just give you the answer. This is a function of x. All right? And the thing that's important that you're able to read when you look at an expression like this is that y is what we call a dummy variable bound variable here, it's sort of spoken for, right? What do I do when I evaluate this thing? Well, I take a function of two variables, it's really like I fix x, and then I integrate out y. Right? So you can think, imagine, fix an x and you get a function of just y there, and I integrate that thing from one to four. Right? So for each x, I get a number out of this. That's what a function of x is. Right? Plug in 12 here, integrate this thing out, you get some number, plug in 13 here, you get a different number uh, there. You can't plug in for y, right? That doesn't make sense, right? I can't have f of x 13, d 13. Just doesn't mean any, uh, doesn't mean anything. So y and x play very different roles in an expression like this. And 
that makes sense, then the, what comes next is going to be a lot uh, simpler. You know, some a student called this partial integration, like partial differentiation. That's cool. OK, so the reason we point that out is so now we're talking about iterated integrals. And so this is the way that we will evaluate double integrals. And so double integral really is the limit of the Riemann sums. We're adding up a bunch of rectangles, right? uh, values times areas of rectangles out here. But practically speaking, we can, uh, in a lot of ways, we, a lot of times, we can integrate a double integral or evaluate a double integral by doing an iterated integral. So this is what an iterated integral looks like. It's one integral inside another. It's iterated uh, here. And we don't usually write the parentheses down, but this is what's really happening here. And so each of these is just a single variable integral that you already know how to do. Right, so on the inside here, inside the parentheses, right, I'm going to fix x and integrate out y from c to d. And so if I fix x, I do get a function of y um, there. This whole thing is a function of x, however. Right, as we just saw. And so we can integrate it from A to B. Right, so hence we kind of integrate one variable at a time. Um, and so there's a nice picture of what's happening here. And so I want to do this. Um, all right. <coughs> I want to look at one of these partial integrals, so C to D. And, uh, from, looks like it's from 1 to 4 uh, here of this example function. As I move my x value, oops, back and forth. Nice. Seems to I'm going to reevaluate this so it looks a little better. As I move my slice back and forth here, we're really just doing a different integral at every value of x. And so that's what the inner parentheses, uh, parentheses um, looks like. All right here. For each x, we get another number out of it. It is the integral of the slice down here. And if we do that at every slice and then add up the areas we get for each slice, or rather integrate out the areas for each slice, we get the, uh, the number we want. We get the double. Um, uh, we get the double integral. So this leads to Fubini's. Uh, theorem, right, which is a, a powerful theorem. It's really, really useful. So it makes the connection. Fubini just connects double integrals with iterated integrals. Right? It says under the right conditions, they're the same thing. You get the same number out of them. So when does that happen? Well, if f is continuous for one on a rectangle, right, that means absolutely you can do the iterated integral instead of doing the three mon sum. Right? That's what Fubini says. So for 99% of our applications, that's the case. You, you set up your problem and your answer is a double integral. Use iterated integrals to, uh, to evaluate. As a bonus to that, there's no restriction on which order to do them in. Right? You can take the discussion above, swap out y for x, and you get the same, right? conceptually the same uh, idea. Right? There's no, no reason to prefer one to the other. And so the upside is that if f is continuous, we can do this. Right. Uh, this is what switching the order of integration uh, is. So I refer to often to the inside variable and the outside variable, or sometimes the first variable of integration and the second variable of integration. So in the left-hand expression, right, uh, the y would be the inside variable, or the first integral done, and then we do the x. Right, we do it in that order. It's swapped over here. Right, We're swapping it for doing the x integral first, right, from a to b and then the y integral from c to d. Right? Make sure if you're going to swap, you swap both the bounds on the, um, on the integration signs and the, the differentials. Right? They, they, kind of, they come in pairs, so you have to have them, have to have them lined up. Okay. My face was taking up way too much memory, I just noticed, so I'm going to turn it off unless I think it uh, actually serves some purpose. So let's do an example. All right, we've got a double integral here. I see that I've got the uh, rectangle, right? So it's a nice, easy setup for my domain, 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi uh, in y. And so I want to evaluate this double integral, x times cosine xy uh, dA as an iterated integral, which is probably what I would do anyway. So I've got to make a decision right here. 
the decision I need to make is what order should I integrate in? What should I integrate first? And what should I integrate second? Pubini tells me I'll get the same answer either way. But as a mathematician, you'll notice that uh, there's actually an easier choice here. And it's really experience that will, uh, will tell you how to start this right. For now, just pick an order, try it out. And if you have run some difficulty, try reversing uh, the order and seeing if that makes things easier. And after a while, you'll get used to this. OK, so what do I do with this problem? I look at this. I've got to decide on my integral uh, order of integration. So I know I'm going to do a double integral here. So I can set up my integral signs. I know the integrand is going to be x cosine xy here. But now I have to decide what to do first here, which to do first. And so what I do is I look and I say, OK, which variable do I want to integrate first? It's the easier one. And y to me looks easier than x. Right? Why is that? Because when I integrate in y, I treat x as constant. Right? So y only appears once here. x is not so bothersome as being a constant. If I were to do x first, I look at this and I see a product of two x functions. That means integration by parts, and that's just a little trickier to do. Would still work just fine, but is a little trickier. So that's why I'm going to do y first. So once I make the decision to do y first, well, then I know I'm going to do x second. And I write my limits correctly, 0 to 2 pi and 0 to pi. Remember to line up your limits of integration correctly with the variable that you're integrating. So 0 to 2 pi goes with y. And then the outer integral is 0 to pi in x. All right, so I'm going to do the inner integral first. I'm going to find an antiderivative with respect to y right, for this function here. x is just a constant for this discussion. Right? On the inside interval, right, x we can treat as a constant, just like in partial derivatives. Uh, we treat the other variable the constant, same idea. Here, so for finding an antiderivative, right, I know it's going to be a sine function right, of x, y. In fact, I, I can divide by x, or there's any number of ways of doing this. I'm just going to simply write it as sine x, y. Right? That's the antiderivative right, with respect to y. You can check by differentiating again with respect to y. And then y gets evaluated right, just from y equals 0 to 2 pi dx. Now, I like to be careful and put a y equals 0 to remind myself that's what the right, what number is being varied between. Right? y is changing, right? not x. Otherwise, if I don't put the little y equals there, I get lost uh, sometimes. So how do we evaluate that? 0 to pi. And now when I do the evaluation over here, when y is 2 pi, I get sine of 2 pi x, of course. There's unknown. When y is 0, I'm going to get 0, though, because sine of 0 is 0. So I just get sine of 2 pi x dx. And so once I've done my y integral, I'm left with the integral just in x. Right? That's it. That's all I need to do. That's an easy integral to do. Right? What do I uh, get there? I get a minus uh, cosine. 2 pi x divided by 2 pi right, from 0 to pi. Now, there's only one variable left, so I know which one um, that is. So I get a minus, uh, minus cosine of 0. So what is that whole business? I get over 2 pi, and I'm going to get 1 minus cosine of 2 pi squared, whatever that is. And that's my answer right here. So it's, they're not hard to do. The hard part is setting them up right? and then keeping track of your variables. The mistakes that, easy mistakes to make or getting mixed up which variable you're integrating with respect to or, or over here evaluating the wrong one between two, two variables. Right. Uh, um, using good old Python here, 
that's the answer we got. There's a numeric approximation, all right, 0, um, 0 0.06 here. We'll check it with double quad. Remember that annoying yx reversal here, but x times cosine x is 0 pi, 0 2 pi, and 0 pi and x, 0 2 pi and in y, and we get right, roughly the same answer. It's not exactly the same, but look how far out we need to go right, before we find a difference of right, that last three digits there, right, due to some rounding right, from floating point uh, arithmetic uh, there. But that's pretty deep in, right, for practical matters, right, these spit out good approximations. Right? That's, that's mostly what we'll need uh, as we move on. Okay, so that's an example of how to do things with uh, with rectangular domains. What about when the region that I'm integrating over is non-rectangular? And here's where it's, we kind of relieve uh, what happened in one variable kind of behind, because there was nothing like this in one variable. In one variable, you could have an interval or a bunch of intervals, but that's really the only kind of sets you could um, integrate over. Now, once we are we have more than one variable, we're looking at the plane as our domain of our functions, and there are lots of different kinds of subregions here. But the good news is as long as it's not too bad, and I put a bunch of asterisks, of course, on, on bad here, it's the subject of analysis to say what we mean by, um, by not too bad. Um, here basically means that we can, uh, we can approximate the area using, uh, using a rectangle. Um, we can integrate over by uh, admitting to the sum only terms where the subrectangle lies in D. That's a complicated way of explaining the picture that I'm about to show you. So let's take as our domain the so-called annulus. Right? So these are all points x and y, where x squared plus y squared, think of that as the distance squared between 1 and 4. So in other words, it's all the points between a circle of radius 1 and a circle of radius 2. Right? It's called an annulus. So I want to approximate this integral over that domain. So here's the picture of what's going on. This is the graph of the function over the domain. If I look straight down at my domain, of course, I see the annulus, right? the circle of radius 1, the circle of radius 2, right? and our points are in between um, uh, there. And so I want to integrate right, this function over that, right, that annular uh, domain. Right? So I see the values of that function are x plus 2 right? as x increases. And increases. Um, here. So what do I do? Well, it's the same thing I did with the rectangle. I divide it into sub-rectangles and add them up. It's this picture. As we increase the number of rectangles, right, we start kind of admitting them to the sum when they fit inside of our region. And just as long as our region is nice enough, and I chop my domain of integration into small enough pieces, right, I'm going to get a decent approximation for my my inner part. Really, this thing converges right, to a number, and we call that thing uh, call that thing the integral. Let me kind of move this around a little bit to let you see it. Right. Still, it has to draw a lot of rectangles, and Matplotlib's not so good at that. Um, but anyway, here's the right, here's a picture of of what's going on. The asterisks, right? It's well approximated by rectangles. We don't need to get into the details of what that really means. Okay, so how does this work in practical terms? So if I have a region R2, if it's bounded by the graphs of function of one variable, right, we can integrate it as in, not an iterated, but an iterated. Let's fix uh, uh, I'll fix that word. Before we forget, right? As iterated intervals. So here's what we mean. So I've got a domain defined by the numbers x and y right here, where y is between two functions of x. Right? So that's the way we define regions in the plane, um, probably in, in Calc 1. And so what we get is an expression like, like this. So now x is varying from a to b. Those are fixed scalars, right? a to b, and x occupies all those. For each x, there's a different interval of y. Right? So y goes from g of x to h of x. So it's important to read this that this makes sense. That the inside integral now it's still a function of x. Here, right? Plug in an x, you get different intervals, right? And you get some function of y out of it. 
but still plug in an x, you get an integral in y you can do, you get a number out of that. So that whole thing is a function of x, you integrate that function of x. Let's see a quick example to see what we're going to do. All right, so I've got a region bounded by the curves y is x cubed over 32 and y is uh, square root of x in the first quadrant. Um, uh, here, we want to integrate over that region. So be careful about where things live here. So D is a region in the plane. Right? It's a bunch of x and y points there. I'm going to integrate a function x times y over that, uh, over that region there. So it's a double integral. Right? The integrand is x times y, but the region I'm integrating over is already defined by these, by these curves. The picture said so 1,000. Uh, 1,000 works. So here are my two curves. Here's y equals root x on top. Here's y is x cubed over 32 on the bottom, and I picked those numbers because they meet at 4, 2 is where they intersect. Uh, here, right? 4 cubed is 64, divided by 32 is 2. Square root of 4 is 2 as well. Okay, so this is the region I'm integrating over. xy is not in this picture. Right? I'm not showing the thing we're integrating in this picture. I'm only showing the region of integration. That's often useful for, for uh, computing these. Um, these guys. So how am I going to write? So the way I usually visualize or, or, uh, these ideas, I sketch the domain of integration, right? not the whole graph of the function, but the domain of integration. And then I choose which variable I'm going to chop up. And it's kind of, in this case, I'm chopping up the x-axis, which means that's the outer variable right, in this picture. So I'm going to imagine, as I move along x, I'm going to have a different integral in y for each value of x. Right there. So x is the outer integral in this picture. You see a little slice of my domain right, for each x value. And so how do I set up this integral here? Well, clearly x is going from 0 to 4 here. Right? And so dx, that's the outer variable. The inner variable is going to be y. Right. And the integrand is definitely x, y. Right? That's not, that doesn't change. The only trick here is figuring out what are these limits of, uh, of integration. What are the limits of integration y? They change with x. And you see that with the little slice moving back and forth. And so for that, luckily we have expressions for y in terms of x. One here, one here. We just got to make sure we pick the lower one, the middle one at the bottom x cubed over 32, right, and the square root of x on top. Right, so that's that's one expression. Right here. So let's find the integral two ways. I won't evaluate it uh, and use up your time to do that. But once you've got it set up this way, it's fairly um, fairly straightforward. You do the y integral, and then you plug these x expressions uh, in. It says two ways though, so this is what I call switching the order of integration, and you got to be careful. It can't, it's not just like a rectangle where it's just simply, you know, this the inside outside switching. We can't put an x expression outside. So what I mean is, I cannot do this if I attempt to do x cubed over 32 to root x zero to four x y d x dy. If you are tempted to write something like this, alarms should go off in your brain, right? This is not a valid expression. Right? The reason it's not a valid expression is to go, what's x here, right? x gets integrated out. It should be gone from your expression, right? What x is being evaluated here, right? I should get a number out of this, but I don't know what to plug in. Ah, it just doesn't make any sense, right? So don't do that. We're going to change to a y variable, and now that can change. And we see different slices in y. And notice the interval in y is up now a function of y, right? So x becomes a function of y for each of these little slices you work. I always work with a picture and think about these these slices. So when I write an expression now, I'm going to write this in this order of inter integrals. I've got y on the outside. y is going from 0 to 2 now, right? I see that the range on y is 0 to 2. Right. And 
I'll figure out what x is in a second. I know the integrand still x, y, that doesn't change. All right, I've got x on the inside and y on the outside now. So now with the y, I need, I need x in terms of y here. Right? I need to know what the range of the x variable is as a function of y. And that's easy enough to find if we just invert these two expressions up here. All right, so clearly the one on the right is easier. That's x equals y squared. On the right is not much. On the left is not much harder. I get 32y, and then I get the cubed root of that. Right, so it just equals x. And the only trick is that you got to pick the smaller one for the bottom. So in this case, the smaller one is y squared. Right, it comes from this curve. And the larger one is 32y, let's say to the one third, which is the same thing. So that's how you reverse order of integration. Right? You, you literally reverse uh, the, the order of your, uh, of your differentials here, right? You're the inner switch. But you got to be very careful with the limits. And that's the skill here. When you reverse order of integration, you've got to change the limits of, uh, appropriately. I always go through a picture of my domain. Helps me keep track. What's changing? Where? What's the outside variable? There, right? But you should always look at when you have a valid expression here. The outside are fixed scalars and the inside are expressions um, of the outside variable um, here. Okay? All right, and now we can actually evaluate this guy. I'll just show you easily enough. Again, I do that y, x uh, trick. Then my functions here, I should know a double quad can take functions of your second variable. So again, you got to be quite careful with your order here. But if I set it up this way, then I've got my range on x goes from 0 to 4. And y goes from g to h. Right? So from the cube function to the square root function here, let's evaluate it. See how it goes. Oh, well, it's a little ominous, but six and two thirds seems to be the answer we could check. Indeed, that's the, the right expression. If we want to reverse the order of integration, all right. So now that's right. We reverse the reversal. We're back to x y um, here. So now when I uh, um, when I do my order of in integration now, right? It's kind of y that goes first. The second guy goes first, and y goes from zero to two. Right here, and what about uh, um, what about x? X goes from the function of y h, so from y squared up to 32y to the one third. Right, what we had on the earlier slide, we get the same answer. Although interestingly, right, not exactly the same. And again, this is all these issues involving um, numeric integration. That's what double quad and quadrature are are doing. Right, they use the power of the computer, which is to do multiplication and addition really fast um, there, but it's a finite state machine, right? It can't just store all you know, irrational and other, or even, even all rational numbers um, uh, with infinite precision, right? So you get, you get a loss of precision as you go. Again, for most practical purposes, we can rate this so we, the little error differences we don't care about, um, right, which is just funny from a, coming from a pure mathematician. Okay. Let's move on to the next um, bit. The exercises I will do in class here. So they'll be here on the slides. They're in the, um, in the notebook. But this is the kind of thing that I think is better done in an interactive uh, environment where I can. So for the last bit of discussion, we're going to talk about polar coordinates now, right, as advertised as the fourth uh, thing we're going to uh, cover today. And <clears throat> the way to cover this is, uh, is to say, this is, this is We'll have to think about what we're doing. The picture that often come up in a second is interesting. So, the idea here is you can express the same function in different coordinate systems, right? So think about um, uh, if we think about our altitude function for for Bolivia, right? Um, the altitude is the altitude. It doesn't right it doesn't change at a particular point. But how you measure where you are could change, right? You could measure your position in terms of some kind of east-west and north-south coordinates, that would look like rectangular coordinates, that's the area of involving uh, rectangles. 
or maybe you have some other coordinate system like relative to the capital, right? So it's you know five miles southeast of uh, of, uh, of La Paz Center. Um, that would be a different. That would be like polar uh, coordinates here. So it's the same function, same value gets spit out, right, for these two systems, but you have different ways of measuring what the input is. And what we're going to try to do is kind of sort through these. So depending on what coordinate system you use for your function, if you integrate it in that coordinate system, you get the same uh, answer. Because for some regions, one coordinate system is better uh, than the other. What this really practically boils down to is just the formula that when we integrate in one system um, versus the other, the thing that changes is the little measurement of area. So in your Riemann sum, right, in all integrals, what are you doing for all double integrals? You're adding up values of the function times a little area of the region that they kind of represent right there. In rectangular coordinates, right, what that means is we chop our region up into we divide up x and y separately, and then each little delta a here, each little piece of area, is just given by right, the change in the x times the change in the y. That's it, right? Delta x times delta y. If I were going to draw a picture of this setup, right, you've got your x and y axes here, and if you want to measure a little box in here, that area, of course, that's given by a little change in the x and it's a little change in the y. That justifies that formula. Just plain old multiplication. And of course, then, when you do your integral, you change from you know, Greek to, to German, more or less. We get that dA just equals the multiplication, dx dy kind of justifies iterated integrals in this right in this way so that's the rectangular story and things work out um, uh, uh, quite nicely there but now let's switch to polar coordinates draw the same picture in polar coordinates and so we're talking about a polar rectangle here what do I mean by that so just a little change in R and a little change in theta graphically this is our we have a little picture of our plane again, right? same plane, same domain, but we track it in terms of polar coordinates. What we're now talking about is a little change in theta. It looks like two different rays right, sticking out here. Right, so that's like delta theta there. And then a little change in r is just a little change in radius. So something like that. Right, here's delta r. And so we want to measure that area right here. Now we know a little bit about how to measure um, areas like this, like we know how to do an area of a uh, pizza slice. And one of the reasons radians are so uh, useful is exactly for this, um, uh, exactly for this region uh, here. So delta A here, which again represents the area of this little. Right, polar rectangle over there. Right. What is it? Uh, <coughs> what is it exactly? Well, it turns. Um, it turns out for like the whole right for the uh, if we mark this as let's mark it as R one R two here. That's actually going to be necessary if we take the whole slice and just do a quick subtraction. We get one half r two delta theta. Sorry, it's uh, r two squared delta theta minus one half r one squared delta theta. That's just the formula for areas of a little slice of a of a pie, and I just subtract uh, the two of them, and so if I work this out. I'm going to get delta theta over 2. I'm going to factor out this. What's on the left on the inside is r2 squared minus r1 squared. Difference of the radii squared. And so that looks bad. I'm going to factor this, which looks like a bad idea, but it's going to turn out to be a good idea. If I factor this, I'm going to get delta theta. I'm going to move the 2 over 
So we get R2 plus R1 over 2. And I just move the 1 half from that term to this term times R2 minus R1. But this term here, that's delta R. That's the change in R. Right? R2 minus R1, it's the delta R that I see right over here. there. And this guy here is interesting as well. Right? What is that? That's the average value of R right, over this region. Uh, right, over this region here. Right? R1 plus R2 over 2. Right? Halfway in between uh, there. So it's the average value of R. So I'm going to rewrite this whole thing. That's R bar is the idea. So it's the average value of R times delta theta times delta R. All right, what's the important bit of this? Well, all right, so you're wondering why that average is sitting here. The moral of the story is that when I take a limit now, as I do in integrals, right, delta theta, delta R go to zero. As delta R goes to zero, right, what's R bar? The average is just the value of, of the radius of this little little point. So in the limit, right, we get dA equals r dr d theta. So really the only thing you have to remember about polar coordinates, if you uh, want to be a bit cynical, the only thing you have to do is anytime you translate the polar coordinates, you include this little r in your area form, right? You get an extra r comes along. The whole seat just how important that little r is, right? If you forget it, right, you're computing the wrong, the wrong thing. If you don't like that limit discussion, let me just draw you the picture going on here. Why we need that extra term when we measure areas in polar coordinates versus um, versus re rectangular coordinates uh, here. So here's the picture. Right? So if I just look at r theta coordinates, if I just had drd theta, I'd be really just measuring in a rectangle. Right? There's nothing special about the names of variables. Right? If I integrate a function and I do dr d theta, the integral doesn't care if you call them x, y, r, theta, a, b, or any other two letters um, there. If I just do dr times d theta, I'm still just measuring rectangular area here. So in the r theta coordinates, right, dr times delta r times delta theta would just give me this area. Right? In this instance, it looks like it's one by one right there. But that's not right, because if I look at this guy, and I translate into what it really means in x, y coordinates over here. So now r is going from 1 to 2, and theta is going from 0 to 1. It really just spreads this guy out. For bigger values of r, theta, change in theta is more significant. I maybe should have said that from the beginning. Right? Small values of r, the same change in theta is small. Big values of r, right? a big change, right? a change in theta is big. Right, that's unique to polar coordinates. Rectangular coordinates don't do that. Right? Whatever y is doing doesn't affect x, right, the size of x. That's not true in polar coordinates. So the correct thing, if I want to integrate under this function in polar coordinates, right, I need that extra r term is what it boils down to uh, uh, here. So what does that, all right, what does that mean? Um, Overall, right here, right here is the uh, right here is the formula for things. So D is a polar region. R goes between R1 and R2. Theta goes between theta one and theta two. Right, and f is a continuous function. You notice that f is in terms of x and y. Right, so you're given f in terms of x and y, but your region is given in polar coordinates. That's the setup to use polar coordinates. And so what this says is, if I'm going to integrate here, well, I can just use R and theta. Theta goes from theta 1 to theta 2. R goes from R1 to R2. I got to translate my integrand right, to R cosine theta, R sine theta. That's the formula for x and y. But then there's this extra R sitting here. Right? That's the most important bit. Right? That's what makes polar coordinates kind of polar coordinates here. So I can integrate if my region is best expressed in polar coordinates. Right? I can absolutely translate. I just have to remember to translate all three parts of my integral. The domain translates to my polar coordinates. Right? The integrand changes because the x and y become the translation formula, r cosine theta, r sine theta. But also the area changes. Right? So think of this r as part of that area. It looks like it becomes part of the uh, integrand, but it's really part of the area measurement here. And if you remember to do all those things, 
you'll have a new expression that again, might be easier to evaluate, and you'll get the right answer. When we meet in class, we'll do some cool examples that will exploit this R uh, quite a bit, and there's a couple in your homework uh, as well. So remember to convert all parts of those, um, of those intervals. All right, we're going to stop uh, there for today. There's more material, again, in the slides, uh, which we will cover when we meet.